Welcome to Farm Source Seasonal Focus, created as a way to share knowledge and advice on the season ahead. Where vets, agronomists, vendor reps, our team of technical sales reps, and sustainable dairy advisors, but most importantly, fellow farmers, share their insights in an easily digestible way. Sometimes it takes a team in your corner to reach your milk quality goals. Dependable shed hygiene, rubber wear and teat care, milk cooling, milk vat monitoring upgrades, and we're your technical team ready to take a second look at your processes or discuss your Farm Insights report. So give us a shout when you're ready. Well, kia ora and welcome to our Farm Source Seasonal Focus live Q&A session on teat hygiene and somatic cell count presented by the great people at FIL. We're so grateful that you could join us today wherever you are tuning in around the world. It's a mighty frosty start here in Canterbury after what has been a very wet week for the whole country. Uh, very wild weather that is. So we hope that it has warmed up in the middle of the day wherever you are tuning in live and that you have a warm cuppa in hand to settle in for the next hour on this wonderful live stream. Or if you're listening back on demand over the next hour, this is all about you and your chance to listen in, learn and ask questions of our guests that we will introduce to you very shortly. Of course, we're in that sweet spot of winding down from the current season and getting ready for the next for many of you. So we thought this would be an awesome time to be able to connect and talk about the importance of milk quality and the role your choice on teat hygiene has to play. Milk quality, of course, is a key driver of value for Fonterra to meet market regulations and expectations of both customers and consumers. And it's also indicative of healthy, thriving animals, which is all what we want to see. There's a whole host of things that impact milk quality and somatic cell count, and one of these is teat hygiene. So I'm excited to speak to our guest today about this and your opportunity. Of course, this is all about you and the questions that you may have uh, around how to achieve a good quality somatic cell count. We appreciate you all very busy, so again, thank you for joining us. If you're watching on the link that was in the Facebook event, you'll be able to chat there, and as well as the registration link, you will see down the bottom there is a chat and a questions. If you can, please put the questions in the questions, and then there's a thing called upvoting, which means that the most favourite questions will rise to the top. Of course, the common question is, yes, this will be available on demand via video and podcast and uh, later to the, in the week there will be a link sent out to you who have registered as well as on the Facebook event on how to listen on demand as, and share with your team as well. As I said, my laptop's here right in front of me and the chat is open, ready for you to test. I want to see who is with us. We've got quite a few I can see on this screen. Uh, so let's see if your fingers have warmed up from that frosty start. And I want to see that you are hearing me all fine and everything's great. And the great way to test this is let me know where you're watching in from around the country. And also, out of interest, how much rain have you had in the last week? I caught up last night for dinner in Christchurch with my husband's auntie and uncle dairy farming in the Golden Bay 500 millimetres in the past fortnight that's why they were ready to get to Christchurch to have a break from the rain so what's it been doing at your place I look forward to seeing uh, who is here with us making sure that you're here settled in with me and our guests over the next hour and any technical uh, questions as well around um, not being able to hear or some any issues, please just put them there and we'll be able to help you out in making sure that you have a good experience. So let's get into meeting our guests. Crossing over to the Farm Source Hamilton office, we have Daniel Hine, Farm Source on on Farm Excellence Program Lead for Milk Quality. Uh, Daniel is there on the left, his role in building tools and services to support farmers and their milk quality. Previously, he worked as a Farm Source Regional Food Safety and Assurance Manager in the Taranaki, helping farmers reduce their somatic cell count and introduce milking efficiencies amongst supporting farmers where needed around animal wellbeing and providing an in-depth understanding of industry protocols, regulations and so much more. And there on the right we have Colin May, National Sales Manager for FIL. Colin has been in the industry for 40 years, working for Ecolab, 
Rehab and Gallagher before joining FIL in 2013. Colin is passionate about supporting dairy farmers with lowering their somatic cell count and reducing antibiotic usage. So if you are looking for a place today to, to be in the right place on how to reduce your somatic cell count, you've tuned into the right place. You got on the right flight. Well done. So thank you very much. These two young gentlemen know a thing or three about this topic. I'm going to now go through a handful of questions to both Daniel and Colin while you fill up the chat and the question bar with your questions. I want to make this as engaging and as interactive as all of our live streams have been in this series of milk quality with Farm Source. So firstly, Daniel, uh, welcome to the live stream. Why are we focusing on mastitis and teat care? Give us an overview on the importance of it. Yeah, cool. Cheers, Sarah. Um, I think, yeah, looking at mastitis and um, cell count in particular, you know, it is, like you mentioned earlier, a good measure of animal health. Um, obviously, yeah, Fonterra's brought out their cooperative difference, um, and part of that is having a, a cell count around 150,000. Um, so I guess when you look at that at an industry level, you know, that's sort of a recognised target. Um, and it's quite a good indicator, you know, obviously cell count um, is basically white blood cells present um, in the milk and typically those cell count, you know, the, the white blood cells are there due to an infection um, or fighting infection. So, yeah, like cell count is, is a good measure of, like we said earlier, animal health. Um, so other reason being, you know, we know um, clinical cases of mastitis on farm are, you know, quite, quite expensive and costly and can um, take up a lot of time and effort and can be quite... Um, quite a quite a big impact on on staff and and farmers. So yeah, quite a quite a big focus. Mm. Uh, and to you, Colin, how do we really know the 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 clinical signs of mastitis? Some of those earlier signs that we may have an issue um, to start to address. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I, I guess the first thing is is monitoring that bulk somatic cell count. That gives you a very high level overview of the herd health. And if that's, you know, if that's above one hundred and fifty thousand, I think you, you know, you should be looking at it. Um, or, or just simply a rise. Like sometimes people will track. You know, we've had farmers talk to us that have tracked down at eighty thousand. Suddenly it drop jumps to a hundred thousand, and they're looking and going, "Well, what's the change here?" And it's Daniel said that's an immune response from the herd. They're battling something, so that lifts. Um, but the other thing is clinical cases too. You know, and farmers, obviously, they can see clinical cases. And once those rise, um, you know, they're battling with that, then it, it's time to look at that. And, and what we're trying to focus on more now as a business is what is causing that. Let's go back to the cause. Um, we. We spend a lot of time treating it, but I think if, if there's one message to farmers, look, let's let's look at what causes this and and see if we can make some gains with that. Mm. Uh, I just want to acknowledge you all listening and watching in on the live stream. Thank you so much from right across the country. Uh, it looks like that there has been very heavy rain in North Waikato. Thanks, Casey. I just wanted to give a shout out to see that you're all there watching and listening along. So get those questions in now as we work through a series of uh, initial questions to spark um, some extra deeper discussion around uh, the issue of mastitis and how we can work to be uh, as the Colin and Daniel were both saying there around that industry standard where we want it to be. Daniel, before we go into um, some of the opportunities for setting yourself up for success, what is that enormity on a P&L of uh, the cost to a farmer of mastitis at a farm level and, and potentially at an industry level? So I think I had a quick look this morning. Industry um, level they, in New Zealand, they sort of put 180 million cost on mastitis at you know at industry. Um, I guess looking at it for an individual farm is obviously very dependent on farm size, cases cases of clinical mastitis, and then also um, you know your your bulk milk cell count. So I think if we put a dollar value on it, um, Dairy NZ and industry research is is saying about 150 dollars per clinical case. Um, I don't know if that's been visited 
in the recent years. Um, and obviously we know, you know, inflation and, and costs have been rising. So it's, it's quite possibly a lot higher than that um, now. Um, but yeah, if we look at your $150 per clinical case, and then also when we look at bulk milk, um, you know, they sort of say anything over 100,000 potentially has subclinical cases present in the herd. Um, and when we see subclinical cases present, you know, cows are obviously fighting that infection, which means that they're not performing to the optimum. Um, so research sort of says that, yeah, anything, any doubling over 100,000 results in a 2.1% production loss. Um, so every time you go from, yeah, from 100 to 200, that results in about a 2.1% loss in production or opportunity for production for that herd. And I guess at, at you know, the milk price we're sitting at at the moment, that, that can be quite costly too. Um, I guess it could, you know, if a farmer wants to have a look and see what it's costing, you know, the Fonterra Farm Insights reports, do a bit of a breakdown on on those two different areas, looking at obviously clinical cases um, and also that, that opportunity around reducing the bulk milk cell count. Colin, as I uh, said there in the introduction, you've been in this game for quite some time. How have you seen um, the economic in- impact of mastitis in your career? Are we trending in the right direction? Look, I think overall, Sarah, we probably are. Um, I was just talking to Daniel this morning about bulk cell count. That hasn't very much in New Zealand, and, and I think we've used that too much as a measurement over the years. Like farmers are very focused on bulk somatic cell count, and they, they tend to compare that. I think what we should be looking at more is clinical cases of mastitis, and one of the things I we've really dived quite deeply into in the last few years is percentages of cows treated and and I, and I think we should be aiming for under 10 percent under five percent is excellent but but I've been really shocked when I start looking at some of that some different farms as to how many farms are treating how, how high those rates are and when I say 40 percent it's not for treating 40 percent of the herd it's the equivalent of 40 percent treatments and and that is quite common. And if there's one thing I'd say to farmers, just have a look at that. Um, we dealt with a farm in, in the Central Plateau. It was a big farm. Last season, they treated 1,200 cows. This year, we did a lot of work with them. I've got that figure down to 400. You know, the figures Daniel's using, that's, that's $120,000 profit margin. But but also, we look at that monetary value. It's, it's actually the time for staff like these guys were, were finishing milking efficient milking great milking turn around geez we've got to treat 50 cows you know that's demoralizing so i think that treatment we, we've got work to do in that space so when i look at it over the years i i don't know whether we've made that improvement there we might have with cell count but not there and, and we've still got a lot of improvement to make in that area so what I'm hearing from you is it's a combination of both loss of production, cost to um, veterinary care, animal health treatment, and also that labour treatment as well, all adding up. And so a great way to be able to put a dollar value on your own farm um, scenario uh, to be able to educate your team of the importance of why we're focusing on teat hygiene and making sure we're getting this right from the start. So of course we want to set ourselves up for success for the season ahead. Um, Colin, what are some of the conversations you're having with farmers uh, now as they're winding down and setting up for the next season? Yeah, look, Sarah, I think one of the one of the big challenges we've got in New Zealand now is, you know, the average farm size, as we all know, is, is really risen. So if I go back when I came in the industry, and thanks for calling me young, probably a bit older than what you're implying, but, you know, if you go back, 25 years ago, you had a lot of own operators, hands-on, knew their cows really well. Now we're going to a situation with a lot more staff and, and people that haven't grown up on farms with good stockmanship and, and skills. You know, we've got IT engineers from the Philippines and and great to have them here. We'd never milk, get, milk or cow, get milk out of cows if we didn't. But what we're, what we're doing at FOL, we're really focusing a lot on, this, on the small steps at the start of the season and doing things very, very well. You know, we, we have an analogy we use. It's like playing rugby. If you go out and do your pre-season training really well, you put in those hard yards at the start, you'll have a good season. And and we believe the calving period is a lot like that. So our focus is really around some really good SOP, standard operating practices in that early period. Training staff a lot, like staff, 
you know, we've got to invest time in staff and build capability in staff, and, and we've built a lot of training programs in around that and helping staff understand that. So it's putting that emphasis in at the start to set yourself up really well in that time. So a lot of training, a lot of understanding the why we do stuff is really important, and that's something we're very focused on as a team and, and really enjoy working with people to upskill them in that space. Daniel, what are the conversations that you're having uh, leading into the new season? Um, I think, yeah, similar to like Colin said, I think just just working out those those operating procedures and, and having, you know, looking at what best practice is and how you can implement that on farm. And, and probably like Colin mentioned, having a plan, you know, how we deal with, you know, mastitis, how we, how we identify, how we, you know, how we're treating, how we're determining between clinical and subclinical cases, and then just trying to look at that, that whole picture of the farm season, you know, what's, what's impacting my mastitis, you know, what, what is causing me to have so many clinical cases, I guess, you know, there's a big range, we talked about things like, you know, obviously tea care and, and disinfection and hygiene, um, you know, the milking process, looking at the milking shed, um, even just milk, milk hygiene and techniques, um, and then also you know things around environment. So, you know, especially in that that early, I mean, you look at the, the weather conditions now. You know, while mud's not avoidable, trying to minimise and and mitigate that as much as you can all, all contributes. Mm. So if you're listening, uh, I can see plenty of you have jumped on the live stream. Thank you so much for telling me where you're listening in from. I, As I continue to ask some more questions of Colin and Daniel, I'd like to know what is one main thing that you focus on very um, heavily on your farm to ensure that you're set up for success in the world of uh, mastitis. Colin, as Daniel just said there, the, the role of teat disinfection, and um, there's a few different ways that it's applied, whether it's an automatic spraying system or whether it's handheld, there's a lot of different systems in shed. The, the part of getting it right, um, how important is it, regardless of the style that you want to go about? Um, just some, some advice and some thoughts in that department. Well, look, Sarah, I think what we've learned over the last four or five years, we've done a, a lot of work with farm medics and, and evaluating um, farms. And, and I, I always remember, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I worked a lot in Reparo and I used to say to farmers, look, teat condition is critical. If you're going to teat spray a cow, get teat condition and get it early. And I think when you talk about teat disinfectant, there's a, there's a couple of elements of that. One is tea condition and, and in the springtime and as Daniel just said with mud and rain around, that really, the mud sucks the moisture out of teeth. so we should be running emollient at, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15%. So I'd say to farmers, check those emollient levels and have a good look at that. Also look at your situation. You know, we're, in New Zealand we're moving a lot more towards feed pads and house cows, like that, those environments and very wet farms, like Daniel and I are both from Taranaki, so if you're up under the mountain and, you know, heavy rainfall this time of year and a lot of mud or on the Haraki Plain, the challenge you get, the pathogen challenge you will get is very different to being on a dry farm. You'll deal a lot more, out of barns, you'll deal with Pseudomonas, Klepticella, E. coli. Now, when you're in that situation, you need to be running iodines at a lot higher rate you know, 3,500 ppm, 4,000 ppm. So what I'd say to farmers is, is really look at that stuff. And and thirdly is the application. You know, we've got a lot of automated systems operating in New Zealand now. And we, I don't know how many times we'll go into a, into a dairy and see a, a cow being sprayed in the back left hind leg, which I've never seen a cow get mastitis in the back, back leg before. But... People don't check on the automated systems. Automation is fantastic and we need more of it in this industry, but we still have to monitor and check it. And the other thing is also checking staff with mixing rates. As, as a chemical company, I can tell you we try and make it as, as confusing as hell for farmers to mix up teat spray. We tell them to mix it at one to four, one to five. That can be very confusing for staff also. So all those things need to be checked, just a basic check on it. And and as we're saying, just the simplicity of doing that is important. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me, Daniel, uh, when you're in shed and keeping an eye on um, the general education of staff, but also making it really farm specific, like 
to back up what Colin's saying, getting that mixing rate right, um, making sure that uh, the heat condition is right for that farm. How does farm source team work with that farmer to ensure that it's set up uh, correctly? Yeah, so I think um, if we think about actual farm and, and service on farm, um, you know, farm source has got a team of um, regional food safety insurance managers that are out on farm, you know, doing some of these service visits that are looking at exactly what you just talked about, you know, trying to help help farmers identify issues in their shed, um, you know, check them, they will check their mixing rates. I guess, yeah, FIL, you know, they've got detergent reps on the ground as well that are helping, you know, set up really robust heat spray plans and stuff like that. So, um, I think if you look at it at industry level, we've got lots of people out there helping. Um, but I guess it's, yeah, every, like you said, every farm is, you know, specific and has their own set of challenges. Um, so when the guys are on the ground looking, it's things like, you know, like we said earlier, the milking process, you know, making sure that milkers are removing cups correctly, you know, cutting off that vacuum and also, you know, letting letting the vacuum drop before they start pulling them off. Um, you know, if you if you do that wrong, you put a lot of pressure on the end of the teat um, and, and can be quite detrimental and, and have a big impact on cases of, you know, mastitis and cell count. So things like that. Um, just hygiene, you know, general hygiene around the shed as well. Um, you know, gloves is obviously a good um, a good thing to use to you know they're easier to keep clean and, and and manage than you know dirty cracked hands um harbor a lot less bacteria so just just little, little things like that um you know obviously your machine test as well making sure that the actual milking machine is is functioning correctly um one of the conversations colin and i were having just earlier was you know with a machine test you get someone that goes in and basically does a warrant of fitness on your machine they go in and they check everything and they tick down and they you know they highlight the areas that have got potential issues but unlike your warrant of fitness for your vehicle there's no one that follows up to make sure that you are fixing those so it's probably just making sure that you know and highlighting to farmers that while you've got your machine test there are things that you might have to actually look at and go back and fix so yeah a lot of, a lot of things to probably look at um on farm to be fair yeah and our audience is um Obviously, uh, up with the play because they've got no questions at the moment. So I'm going to give you a little stick um, or a carrot, shall I stay, say, uh, because this is your opportunity. You've got Colin and Daniel here uh, to ask your questions. And feel free, there's nothing that's um, too untoward because this is a massive problem to the dairy industry as a whole economically, we heard. And to get right for the longevity of our cows, uh, as well as with a high milk price, we need to really focus on this because of that loss of production so don't be shy uh, at the bottom you'll see the questions there so make sure you do I wish I had some of those Kit Kat bars Colin to hand out that you uh, were giving out at side last week and then <laughs> virtually handing these a little teaser out to you so don't be shy I would love your questions I could talk about this all day but I want to hear your questions as well so when it comes to um, teat condition in particular uh, and, and making sure what is and, and is there any sort of tips or tricks in terms of what the ideal composition of the, the teats uh, are to look like and at what point to start getting concerned and what can you start to implement in that, um, that part, Colin? Uh, look, t t conditions so crucial. You know, that's the that's the one place that you your line is a contacting the cow and 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 having really soft and and supple teats is, is so important because under vacuum a cow's teat under vacuum stretches by a third. That's the stress we're putting on that teat. The sooner you get softness and suppleness into that teat, that that will take that impact a lot better. But also CNS, which is Coglousy negative staph, the most common mastitis pathogen. I know it's a mouthful. You want to see me try and say it after a couple of drinks. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that pathogen lives externally on the teeth. It's the most common pathogen we deal with in New Zealand, and it's the one that triggers the biggest immune response from cows. As Daniel was saying before, white blood cells trigger to fight the infection. CNS is the biggest cause of that immune response in New Zealand. If you have really good teat condition, they, they don't survive on the teat the same. Um, and look, when you talk about what does good teat condition look like, it looks, it looks the teats are soft, supple, no dryness, no dry skin on them at all. 
Um, uh, a lot of the time, farmers only look at their own cows. They don't know what good really looks like. I'd encourage them to, and to be honest, they don't look a lot of the time. They just cut cows and don't take that time to look. So just take some time to have a look and, and understand what is good and talk to a few people about that. Vets can teach score. We can teach score. Um, yeah, understanding it's important. It is crucial. Yeah. I was just thinking it's like um, body condition scoring use, you know, uh, from a sheep and beef perspective. To get out there on um, a friend's farm and actually have a bit of a comparison uh, as well, why not? Because then you do get a bit of a feel with where you're sitting too. And um, there's some great advice and I'm getting lots of great questions coming in now, guys. So they just did need a little prod. Let's stay on that question there. Oh, goodness. About the key ingredients to include in teat spray and, and what FIL do, Colin, um, and making sure those ingredients are correct for maintaining good teat condition? You know, that's a very good question. And, and I say to farmers, really check your, your level. So key ingredients, one is emollient. So if you're talking about the calving period, running emollient at between 12 and 15% is crucial. So you need to check with your supplier check the numbers on that because that's not easy to work out unless you get somebody to help with that. So 12 to 15%. And there's virtually no teat sprays in New Zealand in a concentrated form that have enough of that. So you have to add extra emollient. The second thing, you should never run chlorohexidines below 4,000 parts per million. You shouldn't run iodine below 2,000 ppm. So again, you need to check those levels. And if you're in a challenging situation, if you're in a barn, Certainly iodine is preferred, chlorhexidines probably aren't as effective in certain situations, but but those levels are really crucial. And we see some poorly mixed teat spray, poorly yeah. mixed process done on farm. So it's something just check. Question here from Sarah, what's the best practice to prevent early stages of mastitis, particularly any advice in teat wiping as they calve? Before you strip, how effective is this technique in getting right at the start of the season? To either of you? Yeah, yeah. look, yeah, look, we've we're we're doing a lot of work um, now in this space, and and you talk about I've been in the industry a while, Sarah. And is there a change? This is one of our changes, and and one of the things we're implementing a lot with farmers. And farmers are going to be down the other end of that camera looking at me, thinking this guy's got rocks in his head when I say this, but. When a cow first walks into a into a dairy, freshly calved, first time you're gonna handle that cow, what is really crucial is a few steps. One, pre-spray them with an iodine-based teat spray. Why do that? Because iodine is, works faster than anything else, so you pre-spray it. Go down, pre-spray them. These cows are not gonna be putting milk into the vat, so we're not telling farms to pre-spray cows that are gonna be going into milk supply. So pre-spray with an iodine-based teat spray, then go down and trim the tails. Why do we say do that? Because normally they've got a ball of crap on the end of the tail, and if you don't trim them, as soon as they walk out, the teat orifice is open. That will inhibit the teat canal with environmental bacteria. So trim those tails the first time there. Good farmers, a lot of them will do that before they even carve. But if you haven't, ensure that that first time they milk they're trimmed. Then to Sarah's point, great question, go back with alcohol teat wipes and wipe that iodine off and clean those teats. And if farmers want to know why to do that, take that crap off that has been embedded in those teats over the dry period and also take off any sand dirt because the first time you put the cups on the cows, if you leave that on there, it's like putting sandpaper up and down the teats with a liner. So go back and wipe them, then cut them after that. And that will eliminate a lot of that two to eight day mastitis. Honestly, I know people are going to go there and go, cross, he's never milked cows. Yes, I had milked cows, bit a long time ago. But you do that pre-season training and you will change your season. At the same time, Colin, you have also seen a range of different practices and the success rates of them. So, you know, never doubt that part as well. We've got so many questions coming in. Thank you so much. Um, if you are on the registered um, chat, please try and put them across in the questions as opposed to the chat. But I've got those as well as coming through from Facebook as well. So we'll go to one from Facebook. Um, actually, no, sorry. I've got, I had one here for Daniel. 
Semitic cell count averaged 100,000 to 150,000 for the first uh, half of the season, but gets into the 300,000 from, say, Feb. Can't control it. No clinical cases. Any options? Yeah, that's probably a, a challenging one. Um, I guess it's trying to, yeah, obviously maintain those good practices right throughout the season and being very vigilant. Um volume does play a bit of a part and can make it a little bit trickier, but same thing, probably just keeping an eye on it, you know, doing your doing your basics well and probably knowing your herd too. You know, there's obviously cows that contribute, um, you know, having data, data, data. We talk about, you know, knowledge is power, knowing which cows in your herd contribute, um, you know, herd testing three or four times a year and knowing where your high, high cell count cows are and, and knowing what they're sort of doing is probably quite important, um, as well as just same things like we mentioned doing your best around, um, you know, cut removal, making sure your machine's functioning correctly. Um, you do naturally see a bit of a rise throughout the season, it's probably fair to say, Colin, but you'd like to think probably not that high. Um, well, I think we, I think this February, we, you know, we had cyclones go through New Zealand and I think February we had a real, real lift this year in environmental mastitis and a lot of people spiked. Um, but it's... Yeah, doing good practices is good. Look, one of the things we're doing, uh, we're working with farm medics and, and we do a forensic bulk test on that cell count. We take a bulk milk sample and, and that allows us to analyse what is driving that cell count. So that is a really good option. As Daniel said, you want data. There is an option there to do that sort of thing and that's very insightful to know what is, what, what is the main pathogen pushing that is the question you've got to answer. I think the other thing too is why you said no no clinical cases. Um, they also say, you know, like if you're sitting in around 300, you know, 350, you're looking at potentially 10% clinical cases for every 100,000. So while you not, might not be seeing clinical cases, there must be quite a bit of potentially subclinical infection or, or maybe some of those clinical cases are just getting missed as well. Um, so that's just probably something to just, just take note to. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all your questions coming in. Uh, Julie has, from Taranaki obviously is uh, in an area where she wants to know about combating mud and cold in winter. Um, any more information around teat spray selection? Uh, com look, Daniel and I both lived in Taranaki to combat that. That's why we no longer live there. So probably the Bay of Plenty is a good option to combat that, I would suggest. What was the second part of the question? Apart from telling Julie to move, which <laughs> might isn't an option. Oh, is that uh, not the... uh, um, in terms of teat spray selection for combating mud. Um, yeah, look, in New Zealand we've got two teat spray actives available, chlorhexine and iodine. Honestly, I, when you're in a muddy, wet situation, you, the pathogens you're dealing with are very different. You're going to deal with a lot more E. coli, strep uberus, um, not Clepsisella and Pseudomonas, they're more barn-led pathogens, but you'll certainly get a lot more E. coli. Your iodine-based heat sprays are a lot better in those situations for combating those. Um, you know, if you go to the US, they don't use chlorhexine at all in the US, and that's purely because all the ha cows are housed. Their pathogen profile is very different. They'll use an iodine. So I'd say to Julie, look, if you're in that situation, I'll say, certainly use an iodine, but get that emollient up to to combat that mud. That will help a lot too if you run that a little bit higher. Um, yeah, I, I think unfortunately in New Zealand we don't prep cows. I mean, I'm not, I'm not for a moment saying that we, we're going to go to prepping cows, but, you know, we do get instances where cows come in with very dirty teats in New Zealand now that are coming off crops or they're coming out of wet paddocks, and, and that does make it challenging for us to, control that environmental mastitis that will come from that sort of situation. Carrying on there, Kate would like to know, would you recommend using a mix of chlorhex and iodine through the season? And if so, what would that calendar look like and what usage when? Uh, yeah, look, we, we've, we do have a lot of farms that do change that. And um, generally, if you're going to go that way, use iodine at the start um, for the early part of the season and we, we have some, some of our customers that will then change over in November when it dries out and go to chlorhexidine um, and go through that period and back onto iodine at the end with a higher emollient level. Um, is there resistance to teat sprays in New Zealand? We tried to do some work on this a few years ago. 
with uh, Natasha McGuire and around this, we couldn't confirm that. But what we did start, what we did see is that um, you must use those teat sprays at the right level. I think it's no different to worm drenches. If you under drench with a worm drench, you'll get resistance. I think with teat spray, it could be the same thing. Um, there is one situation that we've learned, and that's when you're dealing with um, teat end damage. And, and from teat end damage, you'll get strep discolactae. Is, a very, is the pathogen you'll get from that. We've actually learned that chlorhexine is very, very effective on that pathogen. So, you know, we're a lot of the time, if we know that's a problem, we will swing to chlorhexine in that situation. But, yeah, it, it's not a bad solution um, to swap them around like that, but certainly ID early. Yeah, that's some great advice um, for Kate and everybody listening because at the same time you're starting to get to read and understand more around your, um, those different pathogens and, and combating it differently. Of course, um, the team at Farm Source there to help you as well uh, and on that. How, Daniel, how much of an impact would you consider over milking on um, somatic cell count and how do farmers go about investigating if this is one of the impacts over milking when you've got yeah, it's an interesting, interesting one that um, I know in in the past a lot of research is sort of, or a lot of the the public opinion was that under milking was quite detrimental to to cell count and mastitis. Um, but I think all the recent sort of research has kind of shown that probably over milking is actually a lot more detrimental. Um, so I guess when we think about automatic cup removers, you know, making sure that it's potentially one of the parts that through a machine test isn't checked um, as thoroughly as some of the other parts of the machine. So probably just double checking, you know, what your settings are around um, when your cups are getting taken off and making sure that, you know, you're sitting in around anywhere from, you know, 400 mils to, to 200 mils, somewhere in there. Um, and that you're not, you know, just, just keeping an eye that you're not, you know, those bowls aren't, aren't empty and no milk flowing through while the cups are still on. Um, Cause yeah, the, the pressure that's put on the teat when there's actually no milk coming out, but that, that liner and that cup still under vacuum is, yeah, is, is quite bad on, on the teat um, condition. So I guess it's just looking um, when you don't have automatic cup removers, obviously you've got a lot more control of when you take those cups off. Um, DNZ have got some quite good little links showing you the point at which you should be taking cups off. But basically if there's no milk coming out the bowl and the cups are still on, you've probably left them on for a little bit too long, to be fair. I, I think I'd just like yeah reinforce what Daniel said, that over milking, can be a real issue and, and that question early on about the 300,000 cell count, you know, when you're getting to February, March, milk flows are dropping off. I think that's something we've got to really look at because if you're over milking, you really damage that keratin plug. You'll strip that out and the cow's immune system will not function. And, and we certainly see a lot of that happening in that, that period, February, March, when cows are volumes dropping, milking out. So certainly something to really consider. Good point. Mm. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for your awesome questions. And I've got quite a few more here in my hand in time for some more as well. So keep them flowing in. Uh, I'll go to you, Colin. Um, question and advice last season. We struggled. The, the, this is a little bit specific, and but um, why not? This is all about our audience right now. We struggled with a um, somatic cell count issue all season. We had uh, did have an outbreak with Steph. Arasis, like this. Cold quite, yeah, cold quite a few got master test machine for testing on the spot. Um, currently in the past have used Teat Sweet from Ag Max. What's your best advice? Very wet in spring in Golden Bay. Um, yeah, look, Staph is, is always a nasty pathogen to get within the herd. Um, Look, um, with that, a lot of things come back. The, the cupping technique Daniel talked about earlier, I think it's really important. Check that. that Staphylococcus will go from cow to cow. will transfer and it will stay, stay in the cups for up to seven cows after the cup has come off. Daniel's point about not breaking vacuum properly, and, and it's a pet hate of mine. I just hate seeing in a dairy where people aren't breaking vacuum and letting the cup drop. If you don't let that cup drop and you take it too early, that will cause hammer back up the teat and get cross-contamination um, and transfer that pathogen through. So a lot of little things around the milking procedure. I'd certainly use iodine. Use iodine because iodine 
what we know about iodine, it's way more effective on Staph aureus. Um, culturing is fantastic. Um, you know, doing that on-farm culturing, at least it allows you to find those cows. And if you're finding those cows, please milk them last. Because if you're milking them last, you'll then stop that transfer through the rest of the herd. So if, if the people in Golden Bay are finding them, milk them last. Um, and then, you know, it's their option to cull those later in the year. But, you know, the work that's been done on even treating those cows, the results we get aren't great around that. It's probably fair to say if you've got staff present, doing all the basics and doing them extremely well is, is all the more important. You know, teat spraying every milking, making sure that teat spray is, you know, getting really good coverage, making sure yep. your mixes are correct. Um, and probably, yeah, like avoiding teat end damage is even more important than if you've got a little bit of staff present. Like you said, your milking plant, making sure your liners are, you know, being replaced regularly. Your milking techniques are correct. Um, yeah, look, that, that teat end damage, once you get teat end damage of staph aureus, and a really good point, you you will get more of that entering the tea canal. So, yeah, it is, it's it's just all those little things done well. And, and I think sometimes, look, farmers, you know, you get in there, you're doing the job. Sometimes it's just getting, you know, somebody like the, the Frontier Area Manager, ourselves, a vet to come in and just stand and observe, like so often, people are in the moment and doing what they've done. And so often people say to us, I've never had staph aureus before. Well, I think one of the things is we move cows around more in New Zealand. So that comes into herds now, whereas we had very closed herds 30, 40 years ago. Um, but just having somebody come and observe that milking and, and just make those small observations and tips, a lot of the time it's not, it's not something big you need to change. Yeah, absolutely. Advice is always a phone call away. Um, Cole has a question. Maybe, Daniel, you want to start this one off. We've moved from a small cow shed where we would routinely strip cows to find mastitis. This season will be in a 60 bale row tree where there isn't time to strip quarters. What do people milking in fast sheds do to keep on top of mastitis? Yeah, it's, it's a good um, good question, actually, and I guess it is a bit of a change. You know, 60 bale road trees platform is moving quite quickly. It is quite hard to, to keep an eye on everything. Um, your smaller sheds, you've got a lot more time, obviously. I think looking at, from, yeah, looking at different systems, lots of people have different approaches. Um, you know, keeping an eye on, on bulk milk cell count um, a lot closer is, is probably something that's quite important if you don't have the time to strip. Um, you know, checking your filter sock, um, subclinical cases, obviously you're not going to pick up. But um, other thing that you sort of see every, people will do every now and again if they are concerned is put another person in the shed so you have someone that's solely based um, on stripping. But I guess, yeah, it's it's probably just same thing, just monitoring those things outside and, and looking for, you know, warm udders, swollen, swollen quarters. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think... Um Going back to the previous question with Staph aureus, I, personally, I don't like seeing quarters strip too often in herds. If you have the, the previous quest, question we had about Staph aureus, if you start stripping cows, and you know we've seen a lot of farmers, they'll strip back quarter this morning, back left tonight. But if you've got Staph aureus in there and you're not washing your hands, and Staph aureus does not present as clinical a lot of the time, so you'll be handling that cow and going to the next cow Personally, I don't like it, and I, I'd rather focus back on those preventative things. And going to a 60 bale dairy again, just go back, look at the basics, SOPs, good operating procedures, prevent the problem rather than having to go looking for it. It's Definitely. Like, yeah, there still is a room for stripping, and I guess it's just probably when you are stripping, like Colin said, thinking about, you know, have you got milk all over your hands and then are you transferring that milk to, to other animals? Um, Wash your hands. Or just making sure that when you're stripping, you know, you're not, not actually touching the end, the teat end, you're just touching the top of the teat. Um, but, yeah, probably just going back to your question, just making sure that you're being quite vigilant around all those other areas and and just, yeah, checking yep. udders and stuff as well and, and just monitoring everything. 
Great questions, everyone. Uh, we'll have some time for a, a few more questions to come through. I've got one here from Josh Ball, who says, we talk about teat condition being uh, really important. Would a teat spray with a neutral pH be best for other health? Dose pe uh, penetration speed of a teat, does that have a major impact as well? So two questions there. Two questions there. Um, neutral pH... Um, you look, that's been touted in the marketplace quite a bit. Your iodine-based teat sprays to work effectively generally have a pH between 3.5 and 4. That's how an iodine works. You need a, a slightly acidic base for them to actually work. Is that an issue with teat condition? No, it's not. Um, generally with most of them, um, I could talk on that subject for quite a while and dive deeply into that but in a nutshell the whole neutral pH thing I believe is probably a little bit over promoted um, and what was the second part Sarah about uh, dose penetration speed of a oh, teat penetration. of a teat have a major impact no it doesn't no it doesn't that was promoted a few years ago no it, it doesn't it's all about the active level of the teat spray and the emollient is the important part of it, to be honest. Um, penetration is not something we measure and gauge at all. Uh, one, yeah, no, I don't want to get... <laughs> There's one company promoted and did that, and it was done off a fabric penetration test that they found, and they promoted that and said penetration's a key. Um, so what this gentleman's talking about is something that I don't believe is relevant to tea condition in New Zealand or anywhere in the world for that matter. Yeah. And good on you for joining um, this live Q&A on somatic cell count and teak here uh, presented by FIL and Farm Sources, uh, Fonterra's Farm Source, because, I mean, there is so much information out there, conflicting mis misconceptions, all sorts. So you're in the right place to be able to ask uh, questions. And as I said, I've got uh, five or ten minutes left to be able to put any more questions through to Daniel and Colin as well. Um, misconceptions you're hearing out there, Daniel, with regards to mastitis that you want to clear up. Um, I think, yeah, some of the misconceptions are probably that, it, it, you know, 150 is a really unachievable target. Um, I guess, like we said earlier, the cooperative difference has probably put quite a big emphasis on this um, and, and farmers being rewarded, I guess, when they are meeting, meeting other to all the other other metrics, but that's being one of them, you know, getting a bit of a financial incentive. Um, I guess one of the things that you probably need to take into account is that you're not going to, if you have had issues in your herd, you're probably not going to hit the 150 straight away. Um, and it's going to take a bit of time. But at the same time, I think it is definitely, you know, very achievable. Um, like we said, you know, Fonterra averages are sitting in around that 169. So we've obviously got a large number of farms that are sitting, you know, under that 150. Um, and I think it just comes back to doing the basics and doing the basics really, really well. And, and you know, like we probably keep harping on through this, um, you know, the session, it's all about, you know, being vigilant, checking stuff, you know, knowing your numbers and, and, and doing your research and trying to get as much information on your herd as you possibly can. Um, but then also, yeah, like we keep saying, being observant, you know, making sure that you are getting your machines tested, you're regularly checking your automatic teat sprayer, you know, you're fixing those issues that are found in the milking machine. Um, and you're having, having those conversations, you know, I think just one of the other things with that crop of difference is an animal wellbeing plan where we're asking farmers to go and have a chat to their vets. Um, and, and part of that is also, you know, talking about mastitis and, 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 you know, antibiotic use. And that's a perfect time to sit down and, you know, set a realistic, set some realistic goals and, and some achievable targets um, with your, with your vet. You know, I, I really think that that um, farm cooperative report is a, is a piece of gold and I like what Fonterra's put in up with the, you know, the clinical treatments too. So look, really looking at those, Daniel's point was key. Farmers out there, just know your numbers, know what your cell count is, know what your treatment rate is, look at that, are you happy with that? And I actually believe starting a new season, you've got the chance to really get it right at the start. If you don't get it right at the start, you'll battle it all year. And and I think now's a wonderful time for people. Just focus on those, those points we're talking about and you will achieve it. You will get down there. Um, Colin, there was a lot of discussion at side around halter technology or wearables. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. 
And and I was just picking up there around what Daniel was saying on knowing your numbers and when you've got more information you can make better decisions. How has wearables, tags, collars, etc., um, changed the game and the information on animal health and and how's that playing into mastitis detection subclinically, et cetera? Yeah, that's a really good question, Sarah. Um, oh, I think look, I think it's great technology that collars and um, that we're implementing in the country. It, I think it's starting to have a... Oh, look, we saw the presentations at the side last week. I, I think um, it's certainly starting to impact on fertility rates and, and starting to improve that. Mastitis-wise, it's... I don't know whether it's having... It's probably helping us pick up clinical cases of mastitis more because cows are not moving around, obviously, when, but they're pretty sick by the time that's happened because the collars will pick up the movement of the animal and then highlight that animal. So by then, it's a cow that's clinical. It probably doesn't help us as much with, and I could be proven wrong on this, but it doesn't help us as much with the clinical picture we've got, but certainly with those clinical cases, it will help you find those cows. So, yeah. It's probably not replacing any of those basics, though, is it? Doing everything we've talked about well, I think it's still priority. Um, the collars probably aren't picking that stuff up just yet. No, it, it, it's staff is such a big, you know, a big element to doing what we're doing here. And I think empowerment of staff and education, they're our asset, asset in this industry. And we've really got to, we've got to fill this void in knowledge and get them operating better and doing those basics that we're talking about. Yeah, and I think even um, they were saying that, you know, they're not self-driving cars. You still very much need to understand the fundamentals. They're just there as another tool in the toolkit. But I was just interested in terms of that, um, in terms of level of animal health data that's coming through. And it's it's a lot to try and process on top of um, lots of information to physically be aware and pass on to your team at the same time. Something I just asked you about um, off here, any conversations about um, once a day milking becoming quite popular any trends there on um, making sure or tips and tricks to transition and um, look after mastitis in the process? Can I jump in? Yeah. <laughs> That's a hard question, so look straight away at me. Look, I think, look, that's a trend that's happening in New Zealand once a day milking, 60 hour milking. I, I think it still comes back to everything we've been talking about for the last hour, it's, it's about having good procedures in place and probably that somatic cell count lower. Oh, I think you'll definitely have probably a transition period in there where you could be you know, challenged. But if your numbers are good at the start, you can transition. I, I know we've dealt with a few farms, they have a higher cell count. It's a hell of a risk to then jump to once a day milking if you're sitting in the 300s and you will typically inflate that. But I don't necessarily think cell count is a reason not to go once a day milking if you know if they've got good procedures in place. We we deal with a farm in Taranaki with a sixty thousand cell count once a day, no problem at all. Hardly hit any mastitis, so it can be done quite easily. It's probably like you said, knowing your herd too. Though some of those higher cell count herds, you know, if you're not clearing that milk out more regularly and you go to once a day and you're clearing out once a day, obviously some of those subclinical cases have got more time to sit in the outer before they cleared out. So obviously it does have a bigger impact on, on your cell count. And yeah, but just back to basics, trying to know the cows, you know, know which ones are going to cause you issues before you tra- transfer yeah. to that once a day system is quite important. Yeah. D- Daniel, do you just lastly in, in summary, um, want to somehow encourage farmers to, you know, jump on the problem early and not be embarrassed by a, a problem that or an, and jump on it before a bit of an outbreak. What are your, you know, the farm source TSRs and the, the on farm excellence team doing to to ensure that they reach out before it's a major problem too? I think, yeah, like we said, it's uh, trying to push it back and, and get farmers to look at their own systems and, and, and work out, you know, right, what is my cell count sitting at? What's my clinical cases? Do I have a problem? Um, and then, you know, there are lots of channels out there for help and support. And, you know, don't be afraid to ask, you know, seek advice, give, you know, give our call centre a, 
a, a phone call. Um, like I said, we've got people on the ground. You know, FIL's got people on the ground. We're encouraging with the cooperative difference to go and talk to your vets um, for part of that animal wellbeing plan, you know, and, and be prepared to have some of those tough conversations with the vets and go, okay, you know, my clinical cases are jumping year on year. What do I do? You know, how do I, how do I worry about that fence at the top of the hill? You know, how do I prevent getting those clinical cases, you know, rather than just treating them and, and using more antibiotics. So I guess it's trying to, you know, ask those tough questions and, and yeah, just, just have a good look and, and like we keep harping on, just doing those basics well and being quite vigilant. Yeah. Colin, are you seeing that farmers are paying more and more attention to um, early prevention or has still got a wee way to go? Oh, look, I think there's a lot of farmers really keen. We have some great conversations with farmers um, about how we can improve things and and look they're very focused on that and, and we've had some terrific results over the years we worked with a guy in Colvard and that carved down 400 cows without a case of mastitis with some of those procedures I talked about earlier and actually he was the same guy that said to me you know he was dealing with a staff problem in February and he said I was in a dark place and, and I think Daniel's point's really important like this happens there's a lot of people battling this don't be scared to reach out for help and and there's there's vets, there's ourselves, there's the farm source team around. There's some there's some real good support and some good knowledge within it. Like the girls in the in the farm source phone system, you know, we we work with them closely. They they're a great team. They're pretty passionate about helping people. So the help's there. Just reach out. There's some good knowledge. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, fantastic way to round it out and giving you all confidence whether you're listening back to this on demand or of course watching along with us live over the last hour. I want to thank you because I appreciate you're very busy people um, and it's been an absolute pleasure to have the expertise of Colin May, the National Sales Manager for FIL and Daniel Hine who is in the on-farm excellence team for milk quality uh, with Fonterra as, as well. So as the, both gentlemen said, FIL and your farm source um, team are there to help. So therefore there's no need to do or battle this alone, as Colin said. All the um, tips and advice are on FAL's website, fal.co.nz, and I know they have some excellent resources, um, as uh, with the wonderful Natasha McGuire um, in there as well from Farm Medic and so do Farm Source in their seasonal focus series. This is uh, the second in a three-part series on milk quality setting you up for the season ahead. We had the last one, if you missed it, from Scalar Up around the importance of renewing rubberware, which is on the nzfarmsource.co.nz website. And next one is on the 12th of July, and it's with Cool Sense, looking at the importance of milk calling technology. So you make sure you head to the Farm Source website to sign up if you want to know more about milk calling technology as well. It's been an absolute pleasure having you with us around the country on this cold, and wet wintry day uh, best wishes for the season ahead we look forward to seeing you on the 12th of July if you can tune in and of course you'll be sent a link to this on demand so please share it with your team uh, in the meantime have a wonderful rest of your day thanks for watching Farm Source Seasonal Focus if you want to know more about the content featured in this episode contact your local technical sales rep or talk to our store staff